In this video, we'll work through some sample problems from section 5.3 on the divergence and integral tests. So we'll start with looking at the divergence test. So what the divergence test tells us is that if we look at the numbers that we're adding up in a series, so remember that this big sigma means that we're adding up a bunch of terms that look like this formula, 2n plus 1 divided by 4n minus 1. And what we're looking at is what do those terms go to by themselves? So we're just looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of 2n plus 1 divided by 4n minus 1. And the divergence test tells us that if that limit is anything other than 0, then this series diverges. But if this limit is 0, then this test is inconclusive. It doesn't tell us anything about the series, but it does say that this limit has to be 0 in order for this series to even have a chance of converging. So we're looking at this limit. And in this case, we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So the easiest thing to do is divide top and bottom by the highest power of n that we see, which in this case is just n to the first power, or just n. And when we do that, we get the limit as n goes to infinity. On the top, we have 2 plus 1 over n. And on the bottom, we have 4 minus 1 over n. And as n goes to infinity, 1 over n, that's going to go to 0. 1 over n, that's going to go to 0. And so we just get 2 over 4, also known as 1 half. But crucially, that is not zero. And again, the divergence test says that if this limit equals anything other than zero, then the series diverges. So that's how we apply the divergence test. Okay, another problem, again, similar situation. In this case, we're going to look at the limit as m goes to infinity of cosine of 1 over m squared. And so inside those parentheses is this fraction 1 over m squared, and that fraction is going to go to 0, which means this limit is going to go to the cosine of 0, which is 1. And again, because 1 is not 0, the limit of the terms that we're adding up, those numbers don't go to 0, which means that this series diverges. So again, that's how this divergence test applies to this series. Let's do one more of these. This time we have an exponential term. So again, we're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 to the n divided by 3 to the 2n plus 1. So this one's a little harder to analyze, but what we can do is try to rewrite this in a cleaner form to help us understand what's going on. So let's take that extra plus 1 in our exponent and split that off. So we've got a factor of 1 third, and so we've got 2 to the n divided by 3 to the 2n. And now let's rewrite this so that it's a single exponential term. So we've still got a 1 third, and then we've got something raised to the n. We've got 2 on the top. And because we have 3 to the 2n on the bottom, that's 3 squared to the n, which is also known as 9 to the n. So 3 to the 2n is 3 squared to the n. That's 9 to the n. So that's where I'm getting that 9 from in the bottom there. Now, we know what to do with 2 ninths to the n power. Because 2 ninths is less than 1, that means that 2 ninths to the n is going to go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Right? We're continually multiplying 2 ninths by itself over and over and over again. And because 2 ninths is a small number, every time we multiply by another factor of 2 ninths, that number is going to be getting closer and closer to 0, which means this limit equals 0. Now, just because the limit equals zero does not mean that we can say for certain that this series converges. The divergence test is inconclusive if we actually do get zero from this limit. In the previous couple examples, we got numbers other than zero. And in that case, the divergence test tells us that the series diverges. But if the limit does equal zero, the divergence test is inconclusive. It does not tell us anything about this series. So you got to be careful when you're using the divergence test and not uh, imply something that it doesn't say. All right, what about the integral test? So the integral test says that we can understand whether a series converges or diverges by looking at the corresponding improper integral. So in this case, we'd be looking at the integral from 1 to infinity of the natural log of x squared divided by x dx. And so now we have to remember how we worked out improper integrals. So the first thing we want to do with an improper integral is rewrite it as a limit. The limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of the natural log of t squared divided by, sorry, those should be x's, natural log of x squared divided by x. And now we have to think about how are we going to attack this integral. Well, we might remember that the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. And so when we see that x in the bottom, we might be thinking about a substitution u equals the natural log of x. 
and that turns out to be the right strategy here. du is one over x dx. So this integral is going to equal the, still have the limit, right? The limit is gonna get applied at the end. So the limit as t goes to infinity, we're not ready to do our substitution just quite yet. So we get natural log of x squared multiplied by one over x dx. So our integral is going to turn into, we still have our limit. We'll change our bounds here in a second. That's gonna be u squared du. So our new bounds are what we get when we plug the old bounds into this formula. So my old bounds were t equal or x equals t and x equals one. So when x equals t, u is going to be the natural log of t. And when x equals one, u is going to be the natural log of one, which is zero. So my new bounds are zero and natural log of t. Now this is an easy antiderivative. Antiderivative of u squared is one third u cubed. Zero natural log of t. Now we plug in and subtract limit as t goes to infinity, one third natural log of t cubed minus one third times zero cubed. Zero cubed is zero, so don't have to worry about that. All right, now we're ready to think about the limit. So what happens as t goes to infinity? Well, the natural log of t inside these parentheses, that's going to go to infinity. We know that as t goes to infinity, natural log of t goes to infinity, although it does get there slowly, it does get there eventually. And so when we cube that, we cube something that's going to infinity, that's still going to go to infinity. So this whole thing, this whole limit is going to equal infinity, which means this improper integral diverges. And so the integral test says, if your integral diverges, your series diverges. If this integral had converged, then our series would converge, but it didn't. So this means the series diverges. The series diverges because the improper integral diverges. Okay, one more of these integral test problems. Again, these are a little annoying because we have to do a limit and an integral, but this is what the test does and how it applies to these situations. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna write the corresponding improper integral, which in this case is the integral from one to infinity of x e to the minus x. So we just take the variables here that are in our series and replace them with x's. And then we work out this improper integral. So we've got the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from one to t of x e to the minus x dx. And now we have to think to ourselves, how do I work out this integral? Well, this was an example of integration by parts. So we have to figure out our u and our dv. Our u is going to be x, our dv is going to be e to the minus x dx. du is going to be dx, and v is going to be minus e to the minus x. So integration by parts tells us that we have u times v minus the integral of v du, and we still have a limit to do after all that is done. So we have u times v, so that's gonna be minus x times e to the minus x. And we're gonna have to plug in t and one and subtract. And then we still have now an integral of v du, which is minus e to the minus x dx. Minus a minus is a plus, so we can turn those into pluses. And then we have to take the antiderivative of e to the minus x, which is minus e to the minus x. So we end up with the limit as t goes to infinity of minus x e to the minus x minus e to the minus x. And again, we have to plug in t and one and subtract. So we have the limit as t goes to infinity of minus t e to the minus t minus e to the minus t minus a minus is a plus one e to the minus one minus a minus is a plus e to the minus one. Now, what's gonna happen as these limits as t goes to infinity? So let's think about these separately. So we get the limit as t goes to infinity of minus t e to the minus t. So that's minus t over e to the t. And the L'Hopital's rule is gonna tell us that we can think about the limit as t goes to infinity of minus one divided by e to the t. And that's gonna be zero because e to the t is gonna go to infinity. If we just look at the limit as t goes to infinity of e to the minus t, that's one over e to the t. And again, that's gonna be zero because e to the t is gonna to go to infinity. So this is gonna to go to zero and this is gonna to go to zero. So we end up with e to the minus one plus e to the minus one, so that's two e to the minus one. And that's a number. And so the point of all this is that because that integral converges to this number two e to the minus one, that means that our series converges to something. 
We don't know, and we definitely cannot say, that this series converges to the same number that the integral converges to. In fact, it definitely won't converge to the same number. The function is continuous, whereas our sum, our series, is discrete. For our series, we're only plugging in whole numbers, but for the integral, we're looking at the continuity of all numbers, whole numbers and otherwise, from one to infinity. So we're definitely not gonna get the same sum, but the integral test tells us that we'll get some finite sum. So this series converges. But again, we cannot say that it converges to the same number that the integral converges. All we can say is that it converges to something. And this leads into the next part of this, uh, these practice problems. So once we know that a series converges to something, we want to try to figure out what it converges to. And for the moment, we don't really have too many tools to figure out exactly what the sum converges to. So instead, we want to try to approximate it. And when we talked about approximations, we talk about an error bound. We want to say, well, how many terms of this series do I have to add up to get a pretty good estimate of what the sum of the series is? And so that's where this error bound formula comes into play. If we know how accurately we want to approximate the sum, we know within what kind of tolerance we want to get to the total sum of the series, then we can use this error bound formula to tell us how many terms we need to add to get within that tolerance. So in this case, we're going to uh, compute the integral from n to infinity of f of x dx. And since we want our remainder, r sub n, that's our er uh, the actual error, we want that to be less than 0 0.0001. We're going to make the integral work out to be less than 0 0.001, and then that will make this happen. So this is the, in the inequality that we're going to solve. We're going to solve this, and then that's going to accomplish this inequality. That will make that happen. Okay, so the integral we can figure out. It's the integral from n to infinity, so that's the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from n to t. Remember, capital N is our unknown here. Our function is 1 over x cubed dx. So that's a pretty easy antiderivative. We can think of that as x to the minus 3. So that's going to be x to the minus 2 divided by minus 2. And then we have to plug in n and t and subtract. So that's going to give us the limit as t goes to infinity. That's 1 divided by negative 2 t squared. Minus a minus is a plus, 1 divided by 2 n squared. As t goes to infinity, this fraction is going to go to 0. And so we just get 1 over 2 n squared. Now we want that to be less than 0 0.00001. So now we just have to solve that inequality. Shuffling things around in that inequality, we get 2 n squared is greater than 1 divided by 0 0.0001, which is 2 n squared is greater than 100,000 which is n squared greater than 50,000, which means n has to be greater than 223.6, which means we need to sum at least 224 terms of the series. And if we do that, then again, that doesn't tell us exactly what the sum of the series is, but it tells us what the sum of the series is with an error no greater than 0 0.00001. All right, another problem just like that, just to get a little bit more practice, same idea. So again, we want, well, we know from our error bound formula that our error is less than the integral from n to infinity of f of x dx. We want that to be accurate to five decimal places. So the way to get accurate to five decimal places, what this means is that we want our error to be less than 10 to the minus 5 divided by 2, which is the same as 5 times 10 to the minus 6 or 0 0.000005. So whenever you see this idea of accurate to a certain number of decimal places, it's that number of decimal places, that five, give us that five, and then you divide by two. Okay, so let's work out this integral. This is the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from n to t. My function is one divided by x squared plus one. And that's another easy antiderivative. That's just inverse tangent. So this is inverse tan of x evaluated at n and t and subtract. Oh, sorry, I got those switched. So the n's on the bottom, t's on the top. There we go. So we've got the limit as t goes to infinity, inverse tangent of t minus inverse tangent of n. And as t goes to infinity, this is just knowledge of our inverse tangent function. That's going to go to pi over 2. 
So we end up with pi over 2 minus the inverse tangent of n, and we want that to be less than 0. 0.000005. So we add inverse tan to both sides, subtract 0. 0.0005 from both sides. We get that inverse tan of n has to be greater than pi over 2 minus 0. 0.000005. And then we just take the tangent of both sides, and we get that n is greater than 200,000. And so what that tells us is that we have to sum at least 200,001 terms of this series. And then when we do that, we will get the error within the tolerance that we want. So again, this is a practical application of these series ideas, because again, if we can't say for certain what the exact sum of the series is, the best we can do is approximate it. And then we know, well, if I add a whole bunch of terms, I'll get pretty good approximation, but we don't know how many terms we're supposed to add to get within a certain error tolerance. So that's what this analysis does for us.